going to uh, kind of, I'm going to kind of tag along onto what I talked about last Sunday on our Christmas Eve uh, service. Today's called A Hymn to Him. And, uh, you know, we don't really know very much about the earliest church and what they did when they worshiped. Um, it's, we, it's several centuries after the church has been established that we do find a little bit of what they did when they assembled on Sundays. Eventually, writings uh, from the assembly occurred about the assembly and some of the elements uh, are mentioned, and, and, but they varied quite a bit from culture to culture and uh, from languages to languages and regions. And um, so differing people worship God in differing ways. And, uh, and I believe that's the reason why nowhere in the New Testament are you going to find a place where it says how to worship. It doesn't say. It do, we do not have anywhere in the New Testament that says, when you get together, this is how I want you to do it. I want you to start with a couple songs and have a prayer and have a scripture reading. It, we just don't have that. It's not in there. And, and I believe the reason why that, that uh, order of service is missing is so that people from all over and all places and all time can worship uh, differently according to their own culture, according to their own preferences. Uh, there are the things that we are to do. The Bible does tell us when you do gather together, you know, there should be some preaching, we should do communion, we should have prayer, and singing, uh, and even collection, take up a collection. Uh, but how exactly that happened and who did that and, and, and in what sequence, we, we just don't know. Not until several centuries after the church has been established. In fact, uh, in the fourth century after finally the persecution of the church is over and the Roman emperor Constantine uh, made Christianity the state religion, uh, that's when we start getting a lot of information, a lot of information about church and church worship. And, uh, but keep in mind that during those centuries, there are sweeping changes occurring in the New Testament church and not, not all of them good at all. And so outside of the uh, Bible, we really don't have anything from the first century. It's not until the second century we start getting hints uh, about the what and the, and the uh, when and the where. Where? They met in homes. Uh, in fact, uh, they preferred the larger homes, villas and estates, obviously, to be able to accommodate more worshipers and Christians. Um, by the way, the idea of worshiping in catacombs was exceptionally very, very rare. I think we've kind of had the impression that that's what Christians did for a long time. Actually, it's not. It, it happened in a certain setting. And of course, you have to have a city with uh, catacombs, right? Uh, but in, in any event, mostly what happened in the early church is that if you read the last chapter of the book of Romans, uh, greet those in the house of, greet those in the house of, greet those in the house of, and that's how the church gathered on Sundays. When did they do that? Due to the persecution in those first centuries, they did that before daylight on Sunday mornings to avoid exposure. And uh, what? What was the sequence? We don't know. Um, what, who did what, when, we don't know. Um, but we do know one thing. From those very early, earliest documents, those correspondences between people that, that we've been able to uh, dig up archaeologically, we found out that the early church, the first thing that we really know that they did is they sang hymns. And, and they sang psalms. Uh, they preferred the, what we call messianic psalms, psalms about the Messiah. You can imagine why the Christians would sing those psalms, right? But we also know that they sang Christian hymns. And one of the earliest Christian hymns was actually inserted by the Apostle Paul into his letter in Philippians. I'd like you to turn to Philippians 2, please. This, this hymn that you see included in Philippians 2 is actually predates when he wrote it. It already existed. He, Paul didn't write this. It was already in, uh, being sung in the church before he wrote this letter to this congregation. And in fact, we can safely assume that the Philippian Christians were already singing this hymn 
when he quotes it in this letter to them. And, uh, and so it just so happens that this is the same exact passage that I preached last Sunday uh, as we looked at Philippians chapter 2, 5 and following. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to ask Dave Hitchcock to come up and he's going to lead us in a scripture reading of this passage. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus Christ, who, though he was born in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That's it. That's the hymn. In Latin, it's called Carmen Christi, the song of Christ. And so last Sunday, we explored this hymn, looks kind of familiar. We're going to look at some of those verses that are in this hymn, a little bit of a review from last Sunday. The first verse, if you will, in this doxology is that he abandoned a sovereign position. In verse 6 and 7, we see that Christ in his very form, his very nature, was God. Before he was born in Bethlehem, his name was the Word, and he was with God, and he was God. But then we see that the Word became flesh. He pre-existed before he was human, and his name was the Word, and he was with God and also deity himself. And, and it says here in chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, that, that the Word did not selfishly cling on to the equality that he had with the Father and the Spirit. Instead, it says that he left heaven. Uh, literally, in the original language, he emptied himself. He, he poured out of himself the, the, the honor and the glory and the power and the privilege and the prerogative, and listen to me now, the protection from temptation. You see, James 1.13 says that God cannot be tempted, but Jesus was tempted, was he not? You see, he poured out things that he had when he was in heaven. And then, and as we move into this hymn, we see in the second verse that he adopted a servant's place in verse 7 and 8. It, it says here that, that, that he became, in the original language, is the word doulos. Doulos is not a servant. It's not a contracted employee. A doulos is a what? It's a slave. This is someone who is owned by another person. This is someone who, who has but one thing to do in their life, and that is to serve their master. Slaves in the Bible have no rights. They don't have any privileges. They do not have any authority how to determine their life. They cannot do what they want to do unless it, of course, is what their master approves them to do. Their life is not their own. And it, what it says is that, 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 that Jesus, before he came to earth, he was theos, God, Lord of lords, king, ruler, sovereign, majestic, in charge. And he went from theos to doulos, which means he went from the very highest place of all creation to the lowest place of all creation. Because, listen to me now, remember last week? There is no one under a doulos. There's no one under a slave. The slave is the bottom of the bottom. And so this is why this hymn is so striking we don't have a God who stands up in heaven and said, you better do better or else you're not going to make it. You better stop that. You better start this. And I'm watching you. And don't get me angry. 
Praise God we don't have that kind of God. Amen. You know what we have? A God who says they'll never make it by rules alone. They'll never even make it with the Scripture because there's too much power in their flesh. I'm going to need to go down there, and I'm going to need to show them personally what a person of faith looks like. How many of you guys have tried to fix your smartphone? <laughs> and then you ended up down at Verizon or T-Mobile or whatever, and you go, <coughs> and they go, oh, yeah. And you know, have you been there? It's disgusting. There you go. You got YouTube, you got the manual, you even got the phone trying to tell you what to do, and you can't fix it. But you got to go down to somebody, and they have to show you this is um, this is the here's the settings. This is the now on here. You got to say don't you don't you got to say yes on this, and then you want to do that. What you want to do is you want to wipe that, and then there you go, bump it up. We need someone sometimes to show us, because the book can't always get it done. And the word became flesh. And, and when he did so, he did so by surrendering his will to his Father. And he, it says in the third verse, it says he approached a sinful people, verses 7 and 8. He couldn't rescue us from heaven. He had to fulfill God's very first prophecy, which is in Genesis 3.15. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, as he's speaking to the servant, by the way. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The prophecy, the very first prophecy the, the Bible speaks of, says that it must be a human person to defeat the work of Satan. The moment that God said that, he himself can no longer do it. Have you ever wondered, why doesn't God just kick Satan out of the picture right now? Why doesn't he do it? Well, because he said, very first thing, it has to be a human that defeats him. A son a seed from Eve. And so it says in this verse that he was made in human likeness and found in human form. He experienced how incredibly difficult it is to be human. Don't ever think that Jesus was not fully human. He was as human as you and me. Do people come in through the world through the natural process of birth? Yes. Did he? Yes. Do people grow up? Some of us. Some of us grow up too much, especially recently. I was thinking about Adam talking about this transparent pulpit. I'm thinking, dude, I should have got to stop eating the cookies. Don't give me anything to eat, people, please, please. But you see, did he have brothers and sisters? like we do. Um, did others learn a trade and work? So did he. Were other people hungry and thirsty and weary and sometimes so exhausted they were hard asleep? So was he. Were other people grieved and angry? So was he. Did other people weep? So did he. Did other people rejoice? So did he. Did other people suffer pain? So did he. And is everybody who's ever lived on the earth destined to die? So did he. He experienced everything we experience. And the two worst experiences in the human condition are abuse and abandonment. So let me ask you, yes or no, does Jesus know what it's like to be abused? Does he know what it's like to be abandoned? For someone to look at him in the face and said, I will never let that happen to you. You can count on me to the very end. I am your guy. And that very guy go, I don't even know who he is. How many of his faithful disciples were at the bottom of the cross when he died? One out of 12, that's not very good, is it? even more worse when you think about one of the 12 is the reason why he got crucified because he was betrayed with a kiss does he know what it's like to be separated from God the Father 
because of sin. Ooh, you guys are studying your scripture there. For he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Hmm. So, the third verse of this hymn is he assumed a selfish posture. And then that's in verse 8. So he went from being king of glory to scrubbing the filth on disciples' feet. The maker of the universe, the maker of mankind, becomes man. The creator becomes part of the creation. And let's just think about who he was. Who did he say he was? What did his followers say he was? What was the proclamation? He said, I am the truth. Did he not say that, yes or no? But he was falsely accused of being false, was he not? He said, I am the judge of the living and the dead. Was he put on trial by people who judged him as guilty? Yes. In him all things hold together, the book of Hebrews says. And yet he was suspended from the earth on a Roman cross. Did Jesus ever say, I am the light of the world? Did John say he was the light of the world? Yes. And yet he was executed in darkness. I am the way. I am the truth. Say it. I am the life. And yet he died sacrificing that life. For us. Us. So it's no surprise that in verse 8 it says, um, by becoming obedient. You see, in heaven he wasn't obedient, he was obeyed. When he was in heaven, as the word, whatever he said, that got done. But he learned obedience by becoming one of us. In, in, in Hebrews 5.8, it says he learned obedience. Well, how obedient is that? According to the verse, yes, even that obedient. Even to the point of dying on a cross. Now, it's one thing to die. It's an infinitely beyond that to die, the death of a Roman cross. It's an unparalleled pain. It's an unimaginable loneliness it's an unequal embarrassment to be stripped of your clothing and to be beaten and to be mocked as you're hanging there dying. And so it makes no, uh, it's no surprise that in Galatians 3.13, it quotes, it says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Why did Jesus allow himself to be cursed? The word curse alone is substantial, is it not? Why? Because the same verse says earlier on, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Incomprehensible humility. But the last verse of this Christ hymn is in verses 9 through 11. He ascended a supreme prince. So how did the Father reward his humbled son for his sacrificial service. He lifted him. The, the word used in here is exalted. Boy, that's something we love to do, isn't it? We love to exalt ourselves. Oh, my word, we just love it. We love to position ourselves over others. You ever see like five guys in a room? You know, it's like that pecking order thing. It happens pretty quick, doesn't it, guys? Say yes. Like, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? You know, and that's, what, why, why am I asking what you do? Because I care whether you're, what your occupation is? No, I'm trying to figure out, are you on top of me or underneath me? That's what, guys want to know that right off the bat. And so, we love to exalt ourselves. We love to be over others. We love to be more important. We love to be on the, uh, in the headlines and on the covers. We love to be in control. And we love to lord it over other people. What we resist is stooping to the level of selflessness. 
What we resist is sinking to the depths of sacrificial humiliation. Way before Jesus died, he said, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. And, and that's, I'm sure that came back to these guys eventually, like, this is what he was talking about. And, and in verse 9, it mentions that he's enthroned. God ex highly exalts him and, and bestows on him a name that's above every name. And, and, and in that being enthroned, coronated, he is now given a name above every name. And every knee will bow. And notice how Paul wants to cover all the bases. He says, uh, uh, in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth. Well, what does that mean? Who's in the heavens? Holy angels. Who, who's in the heavenly realm? The saints that have died are in paradise right now. They will also bow their knee. What about those on earth? That's us, every living soul right now. Everyone everywhere on the planet. What about under the earth? That's Paul's way of saying those who are demonic, those who are in the dark kingdom, all those who, who are following Satan, and all those who have died without salvation. And Satan himself is going to bow his knee and confess with his tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, I can't wait to hear that, can you? Because the last thing he wants to say is what? Jesus is Lord, because he wants to be Lord so badly. Every tongue confess. Every single soul who has ever lived will look at the exalted Jesus and will proclaim that he is L-O-R-D. That title means somebody in authority, does it not? That title means someone in charge. That title is attributed to only one person in Scripture, and that is God himself. We're not talking about capital. We're not talking about lowercase L-O-R-D, like some guy who's like, a, you know, a magistrate or a governor or something like that, or even a king. We're talking about capital L-O-R-D. That is only attributed to God. Every single soul that's ever lived in life is going to bend their knee in the presence of Jesus Christ, and they're going to call him Lord. And that means you're God. The one. The true. Now, we know that Christians are going to do that on that day because, well, we're already doing it. You're doing it this very morning. But this means that no matter what a person believes now, and no, what, no matter what a person has believed when they died, this means that when they see Christ face to face, they are going to confess what he has always already been. Does that mean atheists will do it? Yes or no? What about agnostics? What about skeptics? Hmm. What about people who worship false gods whose religion is filled with idolatry? They're going to do it too. What about people who are worshiping humanity? What about people who are worshiping what I call scientism? What about people who are worshiping themselves, the narcissists? They are going to see him, and they're going to confess. But this hymn says, now is the time to confess Jesus as Christ. Now is the time to bow in adoration, for it will be rewarded for you if you do it now. But listen to me now, if you do it later, you get no credit. Because you're not speaking out of faith when you see him face to face. You're speaking out of the fact of sight. You're not saying, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Lord of Lords, and the King of Kings. Right now, if you say that, you're saying that out of faith because you've never even seen him with your own eyes yet. Anybody in here know how tall he is? Anybody know how long his hair is? Does anybody know how big his nose is? Does anybody know how curly his hair is? Nobody knows because you've never seen him. You've never seen Jesus Christ ever once. 
And yet you sit here and you say, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You're saying that out of what? Faith. And that he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And if you say that now, you get credit for it. But later on when people say it, they're not going to get any benefit. In this hymn, this Christ hymn, this hymn to him, we are called. We are called to bend our knee and we are called to confess Christ's lordship and his deity. In this hymn, we are compelled. We are compelled to surrender our lives in service to him just as he surrendered his to the Father for our benefit. The purpose of this hymn is to say, look at how humble and obedient he became. And in 2024, I can't think of any greater need than for church members to be selfless and for church members to be servants. Because honestly, as a church leader, those are the two things that I see are the greatest needs today. Not that we're worshipers, not that we sit in an air conditioner or a heated room and on padded pews. It's nice that we're together and we're comfortable when we're together. And most of you guys are still awake. That's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful. But you see, you and I were not saved by Christ to sit. Amen. We are saved to serve. And the only reason why we're not active in ministry in some capacity is because we haven't gotten over self. And this whole hymn is like Jesus gave up his self and he gave up his honor and he gave up what he wanted. Not my will, but the operative phrase, thine be done. And I can't think of anything that's more uh, relevant and important that could lead this church from where it is to where it could be than for the body of this congregation to be selfless and serving. Think we need more volunteers in our congregation? Walk down the education wing during Sunday morning, tell me we need volunteers or not. You think we need more children in our Bible class hour in those rooms down the hall? You see, servants would take their children to go get taught Scripture. Have I made my point yet? Have I made my point yet? You see, this hymn calls us, but it also compels us to be like him. And in this world and in our families, there's a desperate need for more Jesuses more Jesus's people to be like him to live like him and to do what needs to get done that's it happy new year the old is gone the new can come it can if you want to be really fully alive when Jesus comes back if you want to be that person who says oh I can't wait till he shows up so I can tell him what I did well, yeah, he already knows it, but he still wants to hear about it. Well, I helped them, and I hurt, and, 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 and then I volunteered, and then I helped with this, and we did this, and I was part of that, and oh, can't wait. And some of you are like, oh, man, I'm not ready for that. I am not ready for the boss to show up. Whew. Well, that's something to think about in 2024 right there. So let me finish with a note, a note of love. I love this church. My wife and I joyously count it a privilege to honor Christ by serving this congregation. It is the best church that we have ever served in our 40 years. You are 
are people. And there are all kinds of people in here that have worked and sacrificed and helped and, and, and we've just never seen such a, a large amount of people with such great quality as this congregation. And we're so privileged to be here and look forward to what happens next. And so I just want you to hear that. We love you. Part of that love is, uh, you know, go ahead and let's get on the bus. Let's, come on, let's go. Let's go. If you're not in the going part, the doing part, the serving part, it's a lot funner on the doing part. It is. Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. Father God, thank you for Jesus. He is our Lord. Father, he's my Lord. And I place him on the throne of my life every day. And I pray that I wouldn't be alone. And that by so doing, other people can be redeemed. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up. Let's sing. Something on your heart. Something calling you. To make yourself right with God, let us know.